Our final northeastern shot is of another J-21 at Wooler Junction. Our Scottish visit commences on the Waverley route, one of Scotland's best-known routes. From Fountain Hall between Galashiels and Edinburgh, a branch ran to the east to Lauder, well known to trout fishermen. The branch is perhaps best remembered for the use of ex-Great Eastern J-67 tanks with auxiliary tenders. Two were in use in BR days, the second was 68492. As a southbound freight runs through the junction, we see the former London Suburban tank climbing away to the east towards the only intermediate station at Oxton. The line was built to light railway standards and opened in 1901. Passenger services were short-lived, ceasing on the 12th of September 1932. Complete closure taking place in November 1958. Since the track was very likely laid and the gradients were severe, the J-67s had to run with empty tanks, hence the use of the auxiliary tenders. Returning to the junction, we see the train being shunted before a southbound express roared through, behind one of Carlisle Canal's A3 Pacific's Savisto. At Kelso, in the heart of the border country, we see a North British passenger 440 of the Scott class running round her train. Kelso was an end-on junction with a northeastern line from Tweedmouth. Another redesign for the North British was class J-37, seen here at the junction for the Jedburgh branch. Jedburgh itself had closed to passengers in 1948, following floods in the border area. It finally closed in 1964 to all traffic. A J-37, still with the early British Railways on the tender, is seen at the original Bowness station on the south bank of the Fourth Estuary. Another of the class is seen at Grangemouth, a little to the west, where the first signs of modernization in the form of English electric diesel shunters were in evidence. The numerically small on BR class of WD 210s was used on heavy freight from the docks. At this date, Grangemouth still had a passenger service, something of a contrast to its freight business, and North British Atlantic tanks worked the trains. The docks were fairly cosmopolitan as this Caledonian Macintosh shunter testifies. The docks were originally owned by the Caledonian Railway. A number of English railway designs were to be seen working in Scotland, including a special batch of great central design directors, built after grouping, for use north of the border. Number 62673 is seen crossing the other fourth bridge on the Calais Alloa branch, southbound. At this time, these directors were only in occasional use prior to withdrawal. Stirling, on the Caledonian main line to Perth, saw both LMS and LNER trains. Principal expresses were in the hands of Stanier Jubilees, whilst locals were headed by Pickersgill 440s. Ex-North British lines ran east and west from Stirling. Leven was on the Fife coast, an area served exclusively by the North British. The line to Thornton Junction to the west closed in 1969. The line to the east of Leven ran along the coast, the second station being at Largo. This section closed in 1965. Another Fife coast branch served the villagers on the south side of the Tay. Tayport having become the terminus in 1956, the year Cam visited the line. This view of the Tay Bridge is no longer available from the train, the remnant of the branch closing in 1966, when the Tay Road Bridge opened. The remains of the first Tay Bridge can be seen to the right of the train.
Dundee had east and west termini, the east station being that of the Dundee and Arbroath joint, used by both LNER and LMS trains. Cam briefly revisited Tayport to record one of the final batch of Thompson B1s before crossing the peninsula to the North British route to Perth, by now worked by a Caledonian Pickersgill 440. The Perth line joined the main line at Ladybank, where we see one of the small-wheeled Wesley J38 mineral engines heading north. V2s were common on internal Scottish services, this one probably heading a Dundee to Edinburgh train. A northbound express has a Thompson class A2 Pacific at the head, slowing for the severe curve on the main line at the north end of Ladybank station. Heavy freight was in the hands of an austerity 280, as the only original North British engine was a J37. Our last Ladybank shot is of another green arrow on a light goods. And our last Scottish shot is of another Kelly 440 on the Perth line. Unique A3 with four smoke deflectors, humorous, is seen leaving Carlisle with a southbound train. At this time, LNER locomotives didn't usually work south of the border city, as the west coast main line was Midland region territory. Normal motive power was Royal Scots and Black Fives, trains heading south to the Cumbrian coast, to London via Shap and Crewe, and over the Settle and Carlisle via Leeds, and to the east to Newcastle. To the west of Carlisle was a former North British outpost, the Sillith branch. Dieselisation was rampant in 1956, DMUs operating the passenger service, which was the first in Britain to be dieselised in November 1954. Abbeytown was on the Caledonian branch which had been built to serve the West Cumberland mineral traffic. It used to connect with the Cali main line north of Gretna via the Solway Viaduct, but this was closed in 1921. Sewerth itself was on the coast, and the branch had a colourful history. Originally independent, the North British leased it in 1862 as a way of avoiding problems with the LNWR at Carlisle. It was eventually closed in 1964 in the face of much local opposition, and it was rapidly lifted. We now move to the south of the Lake District, just north of Barrow, on the Finesse main line. At one stage in the 1860s, the Finesse was to have built a cut-off here, but it was abandoned and the line remained circuitous. The Furnace main line ran around the Cumberland coast via Ravenglass and Whitehaven, and by the 1950s was worked by modern LMS motive power. This is a southbound working. Rig was once used for transshipment of hematite ore from boot. But the cost of this was so large that the Ravenglass and Eskdale Railway was promoted to reduce costs. <laughs> 